Okay, welcome back from lunch. I hope everyone had good lunch. All right, everybody can keep filtering in those good seats. Um, I know there's always a lot of sitting at conferences anyway, so I hope you got to stretch. I know I did. Um, so on to our next speaker, and I'm excited to introduce him. Uh, some call him the godfather of MarTech, uh, Mr. Scott Brinker. Um, a little bit about him. So as VP of Platform Ecosystem at HubSpot, Scott leads the company's platform strategy and business programs for its global technology partner ecosystem. Uh, prior to HubSpot, Scott was the co-founder and CTO of Ion Interactive, a SaaS company that pioneered interactive content for global enterprises such as Cisco, Dell, DHL, General Mills, and Microsoft. Uh, he also manages the chief MarTech blog, analyzing topics at the intersection of marketing, technology, and management. In 2014, Scott launched the MarTech conference and currently serves as the event program chair. If that's not enough, Scott also published the best-selling book, Hacking Marketing, and co-authored the article, The Rise of the Chief Marketing Technologist, published in the Harvard Business Review. Um, Scott is a frequent keynote speaker at conferences around the world on topics of marketing, technology, and agile marketing. We are honored and excited to have Scott with us today. Please join me to welcome Mr. Scott Brinker. Wow, thank you. That was like the best intro I've ever gotten. Like, I need to live up to that. Uh, hey, everyone. It is so great to be here with you. Um, like, literally, to be here with you. Uh, I won't rehash my intro, because I can't do nearly as good of a job as you did. Uh, if only my mother had been in the audience to hear that. Um, but wow, to actually see real human beings and not just be talking through a Zoom. This is incredible. I mean, these past two years, I mean, give yourself a hand here, because it's been a crazy couple years. I love this uh, cartoon from Tom Fishburne. I think it kind of summed up uh, the feeling, particularly for those of us in marketing and MarTech. But I know everyone felt this in the digital space, right? Can we stop calling this pace of change the new normal? It was a crazy acceleration. Uh, you know, early on in the process, Twilio did a study of like 2,500 of their customers. 97% uh, had reported the acceleration uh, of efforts, uh, you know, to go digital. Uh, they were trying to quantify it. On average, it turned out it was something like six years of advancement forward in just the digital communication systems that companies were using. Um, Satya Nadella was like, wow, they had seen two years worth of transformation in just a couple of months. You know, we saw this in the acceleration of e-commerce. I mean, just pretty much any metric from a digital perspective was going through the roof. Behind the scenes, though, this was still a ton of work. I mean, we were just in the process in the marketing and the MarTech world of starting to understand all these systems and how they could work and connect more deeply digital transformation, you know? And then all of a sudden, like, yeah, we really had to move the world together uh, in the pandemic, and uh, it was hard. Uh, and it's still hard today, let's be honest about that. But what I want to talk to you about today is five really major trends happening in marketing and MarTech uh, already underway for this decade, but I think over the next five, six, seven, eight years are just really going to help change the way in which marketing and MarTech work. And the first one we'll start with here is talking a little bit about no code, and everybody's a maker. Now here I am giving this presentation. You know, 50 years ago, giving a presentation it's a ton more work, right? Like, if you actually wanted to have a slideshow, you had to have slides laid out on, like, these cardboard with X-Acto knives and rubber cement, and then photographers would come in and shoot the boards and, you know, then develop them into slides, and we need to project. I mean, it was, there weren't many slide presentations then. Versus, like, you think about, you know, today, Microsoft says there's something like 500 million users of PowerPoint uh, worldwide, something like 30 million PowerPoint presentations given every day. And, the obvious joke is maybe not all of those should be, um, but you have to acknowledge that from a just a democratization of visual communications, the world changed dramatically. And this is a pattern we see again and again in technology. And very often when a new technology arrives, it's really only accessible and usable by the people who are experts in that technology. It tends to be very expensive to use. Over time, it starts to get adopted by experts in other domains who understand that technology for their domain, and it starts to expand. 
And then it slowly starts to grow to this democratization of then eventually power users and regular users and arguably some technology at this point that just fades into the background of our everyday life. You know, and so like the more and more people who use this, the easier and easier get. It's like an axiom of economics. Uh, the, the volume of things we get coming out on the other side just continues to increase. And this is what's happening right now with no code. And when I talk no code, I mean this in the very broadest sense. It's not just about building apps. It's really about any of these tools that let general business users, marketers, create things. So citizen creator space. There was a quote uh, from the co-founder of GitHub a few years ago that really stuck with me. The future of coding is no coding at all. You know, and actually you see some of these things happening, coming out right now from OpenAI and some of the stuff they're doing with Microsoft of you know, just dictating things you want and having the computer do programming for you. We're not quite there yet, but we're moving in this direction. And again, I said this is bigger than just like no code from an app building perspective. I mean, if you really think about no code, I mean, there's solutions for like building landing pages and website forms, whole websites, interactive content, web apps, mobile apps, database apps, chatbots, voice assistants, app integration, workflow processes, data analysis, hey amplitude, um, you know, machine learning, video creation. I mean, I'm just barely scratching the surface. Um, and the way these things tend to arrive is uh, this fellow like Clay Christensen, you know, had uh, pioneered this concept of disruptive innovation. So generally, the way it works you know, is uh, a disruptive technology starts by serving very, very low-end use cases that the folks who might have been serving their needs with a higher-end approach, they don't even see it as a threat. They don't see it as a change. Like, oh, that's the little stuff below. It's the low-end use cases. You know, but over time, these things improve. And then they start to serve mid-range use cases, and eventually high-end use cases. So when we talk about no-code building things, right? I mean, like a low-end use case was using no-code for building landing pages. That's great. Who wants, as a web developer, really want to spend their days building landing pages for the marketing team? You know, but then you know, we start to see people using these tools to build more sophisticated things, like a partner directory. In fact, now there's tools where a large number of sites out there for major companies are being built entirely on no-code platforms. And so this is that you know, sort of scenario where we see you know, a lot of no-code solutions, when they start out, they're only serving those low-end use cases. But interestingly, those low-end use cases tend to really excite an audience of people who before the high-end approach didn't work. Like it was too expensive, they didn't have the skills for it, they couldn't uh, allocate the time or resources. And so they were basically these underserved opportunities. And the whole idea of like no code, I mean like a great example would be like data analysis. Like how many times a marketer have a question of like, oh, I wonder what the data on this was. And if they had to take a ticket and get in line and wait three weeks you know, for a specialized analyst to do something that quite frankly even the analyst felt like, yeah, this really isn't putting my uh, you know, skills to their fullest use, you know, a lot of times they'd just be like, ah, it wasn't that important. Versus if they were able to like self-serve that answer right there in the moment, you know, it becomes much more valuable for the marketer to be able to drive things forward. You know, and it's then really saving the more meaty questions and the more challenging things for the experts. Now over time, of course, Clay Christensen's you know, disruptive innovation th theory would suggest you know, these things start to serve higher end use cases as well too. Won't go into that too much right now, but generally what I think you see is ultimately then even the experts start to leverage more and more of these no-code tools as a way to accelerate what they do. I mean, there's so many benefits to this, right? I mean, this old way of doing things with like a centralized, you know, service bureau style team versus no-code empowerment with decentralized self-service, right? I mean, think about the advantage of speed. Instead of waiting in a queue, you know, you can now get immediate self-service. Uh, bandwidth, instead of it being you know, bottlenecked through a narrow and sequential you know, team, it becomes wide and parallel across the entire org. Creativity, now it's no, no longer just a few people who are actually doing this, but many diverse ideas that can be explored. And because we learn by doing, right, that learning is now no longer just locked within a small team, but it's being widely distributed as well, too. All right, second trend that this leads into is uh, lions and tigers and bears, platforms, networks, and marketplaces, oh my. So just real briefly, my definition of these things, platform, I'm really just talking about in the context of software platforms. You know, if we think of things like iOS or Salesforce or HubSpot or Shopify, you know, things essentially where people are able to build other technology on top of that foundation. 
We have networks. Certainly, we're very familiar with these. Uh, you know, a bunch of, obviously, social media networks are the big ones. But we also have, right, incredible networks inside our companies right now that things like um, you know, Slack and Teams and all these collaborative tools have really helped unlock. And then marketplaces are kind of an interesting mix of these two. You know, they're a kind of platform network, you know, generally connecting you know, uh, producers and consumers, um, uh, you know, helping them discover each other, perhaps brokering you know, the transaction, the service delivery. You know, and these things are everywhere in marketing. You know, so like as marketers, certainly we're like, you know, buying major platforms, uh, you know, or interfacing with major platforms. There's a bunch of software for that. Uh, we <laughs> integrate uh, with a lot of these other like social media networks or platforms like uh, app store optimization is quite a big thing, obviously. A whole bunch of tools we're using for that. And then there's a whole bunch of MarTech out there to help us build our own platforms, networks, and marketplaces. So pretty much platforms, networks, and marketplaces are everywhere. I mean, they're in our supply chain and how we deal with them in marketing that way. They're internal, how we work with these things inside our own organization. Um, and then most importantly, they're now becoming all these channels by which we engage with customers. Now one thing I just want to touch base on here with that internal use case, because I think platform thinking has a real power you know, in how we think about organizing in this new environment. So generally thinking, generally speaking, we think things are either centralized or decentralized, and more of one is less of another. But platforms, networks, and marketplaces have a really fascinating way of doing both of these things parallel, right? I mean, if we think about um, you know, platforms and networks and marketplaces, they centralize by having standards and governance, you know, this, this sort of one point of control. Uh, but at the same time, they're kind of designed to like, connect so many other contributors who can then do uh, adaptations and innovations and have this high variation, do local control variations on this. You know? And so when we look at these platform models of how we run, say, for instance, marketing operations, it's one of these cases where we can actually, instead of either or, get a little bit of both and. And we could do a whole session just on that, but um, in the interest of time, I will say I wrote an article a couple years ago. If you search for platforming marketing, uh, Chief Martech, you might find that hopefully an interesting read. All right, onward. Trend number three, the great app explosion. We just released the latest version of the marketing technology landscape a couple weeks ago. You, you can read these things, right? Like here, you just need the proper equipment, and then you're, you're, you're good. Um, Holy cow, I mean, over the decade or so I've been doing this project, it went from like 150 on a slide, which seemed like a heck of a lot at the time, you know, to this most recent one was 9,932. And if I told you how many like angry emails we've gotten from all the people we've missed at this point, I mean, it's incredible. This has been like, you know, 5,000 some odd percent, you know, growth over this time frame. So you might be saying, oh, so that's the great app explosion, Scott, is like all these MarTech tools. Whew. Well, this would be the meme time to say, hold on to your butts, because the MarTech piece of this is the tiniest fraction of what's happening. You know, the folks at IDC estimated over 500 million apps would be deployed in the cloud natively by next year. Now, a whole bunch of them are packaged apps. There's a whole bunch of SaaS out there. Our different estimates put it somewhere between 100 to 200,000 SaaS app products. But even that is dwarfed by all the custom apps that are being built out there in the world. You know? And so when I think about these apps in the cloud, I've, I've started to put together models just to sort of understand, particularly when we talk, people always ask the question, like, why isn't there more consolidation in MarTech? And the truth is, there is consolidation at MarTech. But there's an interesting pattern happening here of consolidation actually driving greater expansion. And part of this is by understanding the, the spectrum of software in the cloud. You know, so if we look at two extremes, from general purpose infrastructure to business specific logic, you know, on like the general purpose infrastructure, right? We have the big cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. And that is actually a highly consolidated industry. You know, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have any software that a company builds for its own, their website, their mobile app, anything internal, millions of those already today. Now, what's interesting is between those two extremes in the spectrum, right, there's a range of things that sort of build on top of those cloud platforms. Uh, there's a whole universe of API service providers out there, like Twilio and Stripe and Auth0, Mux. 
Then on top of that, we see you know, these like large app platforms, Salesforce, HubSpot, Shopify, Adobe, Oracle. But then on top of that is where you get this huge universe of more specialized apps. And the thing is, all these specialist apps and custom apps, you know, they are actually standing on the shoulders of giants of everything that came below them. You know? And so there becomes this really interesting thing. Oh, by the way, I, the quick public service announcement here. We will definitely make these slides available because there is a ton of like really small print on these and I go through them at a just ridiculous rate that's not fair right after lunch. Uh, so please feel free, uh, you can actually get the full slides. But it almost looks a little bit like this, right? In some ways, like the more these cloud platforms, service platforms and app platforms become consolidated, in many ways they help facilitate this explosion of more specialist apps and custom apps. I mean, like a great example of this is actually uh, yeah, with uh, you know the mobile phone platforms. You know, it was basically iOS and Android consolidating the market while opening themselves up to other developers that allowed there to be millions and millions of those apps. We're not quite there in the business software side of things, but it's a similar kind of dynamic. And let's face it, the number of developers in the world continues to grow. Uh, these developers are going to leverage more and more of these cloud platforms, API platforms, app platforms. You know, the acceleration of software eating the world is not slowing down. And that's just thinking about like professional developers, right? We started with this first trend of more and more of these tools that are allowing non-professional developers to actually start to create increasingly impressive apps on their own. You know, to just give you a sense of scale here, so there's one no-code platform. I'm just picking this one because they published this stat, uh, AppSheet, which was acquired by Google a few years ago. That's a very straightforward, like, you know, no-code app builder, mostly used for building little internal apps. Just on that one no-code platform, as of a couple months ago, they had 3.8 million apps that have been, you know, created and deployed. Now, we could have a whole philosophical debate over, you know, some sort of, you know, adult beverage, whether or not, like, oh, is that a real app or should it count or whatnot? I would argue it does. Like this boundary of what is or isn't an app is getting really fuzzy. Which actually then leads us into this fourth trend of the shift from big data to big ops. You probably heard the phrase, far too many times data is the new oil. I really do not like this phrase. Um, it's not just because I'm a you know, fan of green energy. Um, it is because I think there's a better phrase, which is that data is the new oil paint. You know, so when you think about oil paints, right, I mean, there's actually a high variety of, you know, the costs uh, for them, a little bit like, you know, raw data, right? Like you can get some really cheap acrylic or, you know, early oil paints for like, I don't know, $10 a tube on Amazon. But there are also some rarer ones that like this one cadmium orange, you know, that I found on Amazon for, on sale for $264, hey, and free shipping. You know, and so this is a little bit more like data because it's not commoditized. There is some range in value you know, of different kinds of data. But the real reason I love this metaphor is because the value is not in the data. The value is not in the oil paint. The value is in what gets created on the other side. You know, with oil paints, you know, if you get something that's worth $450 million, that you know, dwarfs the $264 bottle of uh, oil paint. Now, we see data, of course, continuing to explode. Um, we continue to actually see that even for all this data that we've got, we're not even harnessing uh, as much of it as we should. You know, so part of this whole thing of like moving from you know, data as the new oil to data as the new oil paint is how do we get better at harnessing this data, like putting it to canvas? And one of the models I look at for this is thinking about, okay, well, how do we get value out of data? I think it's kind of on two axes. There's data distillation and data activation. So we'll start with data distillation, which is really about going from raw data you know, to process data, it then becomes augmented. At some point it becomes information. And at some point beyond that, it becomes knowledge and insight. You know, on the data activation side, right, it's one thing to just store the data in a big data lake somewhere in the sky. You know, it's another thing, oh, now we start to report on it. Oh, now we actually start to analyze it. Ooh, now we're making decisions on it. Now we're executing those decisions. And so if you look at these two axes together, this combination is how I think we really harness value out of data. You know, and the top part of this uh, you know, matrix is really about our data intelligence, how we get better at that. Uh, and the bottom half is more of our data reflexes. And I choose the word reflexes very intentionally here because this process of analyzing, deciding, and executing on data isn't just done in human time anymore. It's done by algorithms and in more and more cases as well, too. 
And this takes us into a very different place where for 10 years or so, we were talking about big data. How do we deal with the scale and complexity of all this data that's collected and stored and analyzed? To now a whole new challenge, which is on top of that data, we have this explosion of the scale and complexity of all these different apps and agents and analyses and automations that are all running in parallel all throughout our organization on top of this. You know, the, uh, so I shared that, uh, you know, stat from IDC. Actually, I flew right by it, you know, showing this exponential growth in the amount of data uh, in the world, which you all know, right? In that same report, IDC had shared another stat, which was the exponential growth in the number of interactions with data. And that is the one that really gets to the point of, okay, it's not just about big data. It's about what are we doing with this data and that really gets us into a world of big ops. I mean, if you think of big data as like this far away data lake, you know, you need a professional guide to hike up and peer into its depths for wisdom. You know, big ops, it's still a huge body of water, but it's more like this giant interactive water park. Everyone's in here splashing around. And we see this with the incredible growth of all these ops functions all throughout the company, right? It's not just marketing ops or dev ops or product ops, it's data ops and revenue ops and sales ops and partner ops and so on and so on. And there's some shared DNA here about all being able to leverage data and automations and software to architect this. But one of our challenges now is how we start to connect all these different ops functions together. And there's a ton of work to be done there, not just from a coordination perspective, but even how we manage this. Now that we're actually actioning on this data, you know, there's a ton of these challenges that we find ourselves wrestling with. I mean, certainly marketing has, uh, you know, ever since GDPR, you know, had to figure out the whole regulatory compliance across many jurisdictions. That situation is not getting any easier anytime soon. But it's also more importantly understanding things like, okay, the bias that comes into all these different data sets, especially when we're feeding them into AI and machine learning, when we start turning things more and more over to algorithms, how are we thinking about the fairness of those algorithms? What do we even mean by the word fairness? You know? And so this role of like data ethics and ethical algorithms, which sounded like an obscure PhD you know, five, 10 years ago, now is the sort of stuff that folks in marketing ops certainly other ops functions too, but marketing ops need to be thinking about very carefully. This is a part of the job. Which then brings us to the last trend. <laughs> Probably the most exciting one, right? This whole thing of like, how do we harmonize human and machine? Uh, there was a study a couple years ago that struck me really interesting. They were asking people like, oh, how concerned are you about AI or ML, uh, you know, like limiting the growth of your career? And the thing that I found really fascinating about it was the younger you were, the more concerned you were about that, which perhaps makes sense. Um, but I'd like to come to you and say that I think we've got a path forward here that is a little bit more optimistic. So right now today, right, we have work we do as humans, we have work we turn over to machines. Uh, let's pick a number, let's say roughly like there's some sort of 50-50 split here. You know, and the concern is like, oh, well, as you know, machines get smarter and smarter at what they can do, and they take on more and more of these tasks, we're just gonna run out of tasks for us as humans. You know, I mean, like, it's gonna be like HAL 9000, like, why are you touching the campaign, Dave? This is highly irregular. Uh, <laughs> open the content bay doors, HAL. Nope, can't do that. Um, anyways, all right. Um, I actually think it's gonna look a little bit more like this which is yes, the amount of work that we're turning over machines is gonna accelerate tremendously, but there is so much we can build on top of this. You know, I mean, I look at this through the lens of the growth in what human marketers become capable of doing. You know, and we can even go back to that first trend of no code. I mean, the fact that so many of these no code solutions are powered by AI and ML, to get to a place where a marketer has an idea and instead of saying, yeah, that was a nice idea, maybe, maybe some year we can do that, to actually be able like, oh, let's actually, let's test this out, let's try it, let's do it. I mean, that's friggin' amazing, you know, because as it turns out, you know, <laughs> no one has a shortage of ideas, but uh, people in marketing seem to have a particular non-shortage of ideas. You know, so think about, like, if you could turn over more of your work, you know, to machines, get an extra two hours in every day, what could you do with those two hours that would be productive? Spend more time talking with customers, do more collaboration with your peers, Engage in more creative experimentation. Do more learning, heck, do more teaching. More focus on leadership. 
even just more time to think? Wow, yes, I've scheduled an hour or two now in the day to think about things. Because this is what leads to more innovation. To me, I look at this, you know, again, we can go back to that Clay Christensen model is, you know, today AI and ML is, you know, generally serving a lot of these low-end use cases. Um, and frankly, even as it starts to go up this curve, a lot of the things that they'll tackle are things that we as marketers, we weren't even sure it was worth doing manually. I mean, I'll give you a great example. Uh, send time optimization with email, right? Like in theory, this is great, right? You know, what's the right time to send a particular email on a campaign to each particular person? Can you imagine a human being sitting there and trying to do this on a spreadsheet? I mean, first of all, they'd quit. Uh, second of all, right, that, that, that RRI is a gar fly. But when you feed it over to an ML algorithm and it instantaneously is able to make those choices and it actually then increases your open rates by 5%, 10%, friggin' awesome, love it. You know, we think of this even now with like long tail keyword optimization and SEO. How much of that should be done by humans? How much should be done by machines? Over time, you start to see things with like uh, GPT-3, you know, being able to do more writing. Well, think about all the writing of like long tail case studies. That's really hard to justify a human crafting all of these things, but a human working in conjunction with a GPT-3 powered engine. Oh, actually, yeah, we could really increase that library. And so this model I want to leave you with is this idea. We've had this way of thinking about things as like, oh, more human or less human, more automated or less automated. You know, the lower left corner of that uh, two by two is stuff that is really manual. Cutting and pasting falls in this category. It's not automated. It's frankly not very human fulfilling either. We've got plenty of examples where we go up and we automate things and they become more mechanized, right? Anytime you've got like a rules-based automation, that fits that model. There's certainly plenty of things for us to do as humans that continue to be better, right? Like, you know, they're more meaningful work. Anytime we're engaging one-on-one -on -one with a customer or a partner is a great example of that. But the super exciting stuff is what happens at the intersection of these two, where we're using you know, AI and machines to be able to help us identify the most valuable opportunities for us to do meaningful human engagement. So I apologize. It's been a while since I've been physically on stage, and I have underestimated the ratio between content and time. So I've got red lights beeping at me. I will simply say that this, this future of harmonizing what we do as humans and machines, I think is the single greatest trend of what is going to happen with marketing and marketing technology over the rest of this decade. It's a tremendous opportunity for all of us in the room to rewrite new playbooks of how marketing is done uh, with these capabilities. I think this isn't going to be like the, the end of marketing. I think this is going to be the beautiful explosion of the age of the augmented marketer. And what I see is we go from this mode where all these things we want to do to move heaven and earth, you know, that we actually end up with a much, you know, longer lever uh, to be able to uh, move, move this leveraging these MarTech technologies. Uh, just to quib, uh, uh, ooh, Archimedes, give me a lever long enough and fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Uh, I think this is where we're headed with MarTech. So thank you very much for having me. Enjoy the rest of Amplify. Thank you.